industry, this has never been uncontroversial, and indeed you might argue that in health right now, it's never been more controversial than what's been going on in the NHS bill. But it's equally clear that despite this 20-year history, uh, the, the ability to contract wealth and services may probably remain somewhat in its infancy. How to manage these markets well, how to decide when they're appropriate, how to ensure the taxpayer gets value for money from them, you know, an efficient, effective and quality service at a fair price, all that remains a challenge. Now, the full programme of the Institute's activities in this area is on your seats, uh, and today's event is about adult social care, which is, for example, a very different market to the welfare to work one. Uh, while these seminars are, in a sense about, seminars are, in a sense, about learning from history, we're not going to take a linear approach, but try to examine the history through a number of themes. What were the forces for change? What were the obstacles? How successfully were they tackled? What could have been done differently? And from that, perhaps, learn lessons that might apply not just in this sector, but in others. We've got an extremely distinguished panel for you, most of whom we've known to you, all of you, but we'll just run down the line. We've got Richard Humphreys from the far end, who's the senior fellow in social care at the King's Fund. We have Dame Denise Platt, former chair of the Commission for Social Care Inspection, among many other things. Uh, we've got David Bean, director of social care at the Department of Health. Peter Hay, the current president of the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services. And Phil Hope, who was Minister for Care Services in the last Labour government. We'll start with Richard and Denise discussing the forces for change. We'll move on to the other three speakers discussing some of the successes and failures. And then we'll hopefully have a broader discussion, which we hope you will <coughs> all take part. Uh, if, even if we haven't involved you before then. I should remind you that this event is, is being videoed and will be available online, so what you say is on the record. And if you do get engaged, could you say who you are and where you're from? We've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's make a start. Richard. Yes, thank you, Nick. Um, the title of the session is Learning from History, and uh, you look a fairly broad-minded and robust audience that won't be offended, I hope, by the one profanity I'm going to use this evening, but I just can't resist um, quoting Alan Bennett, you know, who said that history is just one fucking thing after another. Uh, <laughs> no one has walked out at that point. That will be an outtake. So, um, and he wasn't referring to the procession of green papers, white papers, commissions, consultations, <laughs> engagement exercises. Uh, and I know that we're not going to do the kings and queens approach to history this evening. So I, I just want to select two. Um, developments which in their own ways have set out or, or rather have had impacts uh, on the social care market but in very very different ways. Uh, the first one um, you saw earlier on the top of the screen there and it goes back believe it or not right back to the late 1970s where individual social security offices up and down the country started to make decisions in response to various pressures to make board and lodging payments for people in residential care. That later got rationalised into a single national policy. Uh, there were three big effects which are still with us today. The first is an explosion um, in private uh, residential and nursing care homes. Um, and just to illustrate that, 64,000 places in 1980. Um, by 1993, that had gone up to 338,000, five-fold increase, um, fueled by people's own choices, fueled by demand, um, and funded through a budget that was not cash limited. So the first consequence was to create the sort of contours of a very big um, care sector that, that we have still today. The second uh, consequence is that when government realised that, that, that spending on this was spiralling out of control, um, they capped the budget, transferred it to local authorities who actually did an incredibly effective job of bringing it under control. But that in turn had other consequences that we are still uh, dealing with uh, today. Uh, and at the same time, I think the failure of um, assessment and care management within the community care changes um, in the early 90s um, did not bring about the individualised care packages that we are still trying to achieve today through personalisation. The third impact of those ad hoc decisions back in the 70s uh, was of course to encourage the NHS to move out of long term care um, and instead to place people in nursing homes where residents would be entitled to social security funding and the net effect of that over the years has been to shift the balance um, of responsibility 
uh, between NHS care free at the point of use and means tested social care. So hence, much of the problem that we have today of continuing healthcare and where people sit um, is a manufactured uh, problem um, as a result of a policy accident rather than deliberate design. Um, so so the, the landscape of social care is profoundly affected today by those decisions that were taken in an entirely unintended way um, all those years ago. I just want to switch now to another development uh, which what has been planned and entirely intentional and that is about personalisation and direct payments and budgets which I think everybody um, agrees is, is a good thing. Um, the issue being that since 96 when the Direct Payments Act uh, came in, it took, um, it took 13 years uh, to get up to 166,000 people on direct payments. That's less than 10% of the workforce. Uh, something happened from 2009-10 because the figures doubled in, in the next year. Um, but you know, this is hardly transformational change. This is more geological change. Uh, so you have here two, two developments. One has had a profound impact that we're still dealing with, one that we're still um, aspiring uh, towards. So four quick points and then I'll uh, move on. Um, I'll, Denise will come in. Uh, the first point is that today's market um, really owes more to the entirely unintended consequence of, of decisions made outside the social care system. Uh, and that, I think, illustrates the limits of change that can be mandated through top-down policy. And I think it also illustrates that the financial levers and incentives probably trump everything uh, when all is said and done. The second point is that although uh, today's market uh, is dominated by private provision, not 90% of, of, of care home places, 84%, I think, of domiciliary care through the, through the independent sector, it has been shaped largely by public money. That will change. That will go into reverse. And uh, we may wish to debate what that will mean. The third question I pose is what difference has commissioning made in all of this? Uh, and the more I look at this, it, the more cynical um, I become because it, it seems to us the work we're doing on integrated care at the King's Fund that a lot of the innovation, and I think this applies to social care as well, is actually coming from providers. You know, it's providers that are driving change and innovation. And my final point is that the impact of the individual on all of this in shaping the kind of market that we have today has actually been quite limited, especially in terms of personal budget holders or self-funders, where the evidence seems to suggest that people largely uh, purchase what they already uh, know about or what already exists. And social care must be the only market where the collective result of hundreds of thousands of separate decisions is that things stay pretty much the same. There's no other market where this uh, seems to happen, it seems to me. And that raises bigger questions about why the social care market doesn't work as well um, as it could. It raises the question of why, uh, why is adult social care a technological black hole? Um, why is information advice so poor and the various symmetries around that. But those are four quick conclusions. I'll hand over to you, Denise. I want to go straight on. Uh, when I was asked to do this, the people asking me didn't know that I was president of ADSS <coughs> in the year that community care was implemented mm -hmm. and I'd been vice president in the run-up to the two years. So I have just looked back at the speeches I was giving at the time um, because our brief was to look at the history and the obstacles that we were encountering. Um, and so I'm going to dwell on that introduction of community care in 1993. Um, interestingly, one of the spurs that I recollect was that actually we had quasi-markets already in health and education. Uh, and so it seemed a logical consequence that we ought to look at quasi-markets in social care. And what do I mean by a quasi-market? There are some common elements in quasi-markets which were identified at the time. It was a separation of purchasing and provision, so there were structural imperatives behind this development of the market in social care. There was managerial authority and responsibility given to provider units who were sort of separated and acting in different ways. And there was usually a change of funding to the providers, either through a formula, as we saw in local management of schools, or in contracts. Uh, and this is where 
contracts started in the social care era. Uh, there's also another feature in that the end user rarely exchanges money for the commodity that's there in the market. And although there are fees and charges in social care, actually those fees and charges are nowhere near the cost of the service. So very heavily subsidised still um, by state subsidies and by heavily funded um, by the state sector. So quasi-markets were around at the time. So we were just another flavour of the month. Uh, as Richard had said, there was unchecked spending on the social security budget, huge expansion of private residential care in the 80s, mainly small providers, a lot of them spending their redundancy money from the last recession into developing very small establishments, which were their pension investment for later. And some of that is noticed later because some of the big conglomerates we now see siphoned up quite a lot of those small establishments into bigger companies. So we saw bigger companies developing through acquisition. We'd had the 1984 Residential Homes Act to try and bring in some standards because there was real concern about who was running these new sorts of establishments uh, and what was the suitability of those people. So there was a positive intervention by government following the Griffiths report into the existing market to try and change it, to get local authorities to be responsible, the sole uh, responsible agency for public funding in the independent sector and to manage that pot of money explicitly to cap it. And th there was a view that there was an oversupply so the role given to local authorities was cap it, reduce it. And that was a, one of the very big imperatives um, behind the expectations <coughs> of the time. Cap it, reduce it, and offer people a choice of domiciliary care. So it was cap it, reduce it, and move resources into this different sort of care because residential care is expensive, people have chosen it because it's there, <coughs> and let's have the development of care that actually helps to support people in, its own, in their own homes. So a bit of choice, but actually just choice of a different model. This was the time that we introduced eligibility criteria. Not the fair access to care services, but general eligibility criteria, which were devised by individual local authorities. And there was a wonderful piece of Audit Commission <laughs> guidance, which I can quote, that local authorities are required to draw their eligibility criteria such that only the number of people that they can afford to finance will meet it. <laughs> so there you are. It was explicit about rationing, stopping, and developing a different sort of market. The other element that was there, real distrust of the monopoly of provision by the public sector. <laughs> well, here we go again. Were they giving value for money? Were they sensitive to individual needs? This is the time that we had CCT, CCT compulsory competitive tendering, and there was a big debate about whether compulsory competitive tendering ought to be introduced into social care was decided not to go that route, but to try and develop a, a different sort of market. So councils were required to encourage and expand the independent sector, whilst actually maintaining high quality public sector services, but not as many. And what we had seen in the run-up to community care and the accessibility of social security funding was a number of in-house residential care services transferred into independent trusts so that they qualified for the money and were therefore independent. So there was a, a whole range of initiatives around this. The health service did exactly the same. The health service moved out of long-term nursing home care on hospital wards into funding nursing homes using social security money. So an issue on the platforms was about the boundary between health and social care and who would pay for what in this new environment. Always been a mixed economy of care in social care. The voluntary sector had played a big part in the 40s and 50s. Private sector emerged in the 80s. Interestingly enough, this is when we also moved away from grant aiding the voluntary sector into the contract culture and contracts. 
That was a huge obstacle at the time and a real concern for the voluntary sector who felt that that was eroding who they were very particularly. And let's not forget when we were allocated the special transitional grant, 85% of it was hypothecated to be spent in the independent sector explicitly because that sector had come to rely on that level of funding and therefore it should continue to be spent. So this was local authorities, we're transferring this social security money to you, we want you to develop the market and we're ring fencing it so you can't spend it on you. It has to be spent in this different part of the sector. The other thing that I remember is we were inundated by guidance. We were, and I've got shelves full of it still. A community care support force, implementation was delayed three years, and the guidance is all about contracting and purchasing. The word commissioning appears every now and again, but it's about specifications. This is really to the roots of CCTV, uh, CCTV, even that, <laughs> CCT and procurement. And for me, sows the seeds of why commissioning has not really been thought through beyond contracting. And people use the word commissioning when actually what they're doing is contracting. And if you've seen the guidance, then you'd absolutely know why. The other thing that was around at the time, which I think was, was there for quite a while, was a public sector distrust of the independent sector. You know, what are they in it for? Uh, and, and what are their motives for doing this? I said there were many small operators around at the time. Uh, local authorities were also uh, responsible for inspecting the independent sector provision at the time. And there was a lot of debate about their even-handedness and ultimately the responsibilities were removed because of the conflict of being inspector, commissioner and still having some provision. And although <coughs> the intention was to develop more domiciliary care services. And I think we've seen more domiciliary care services develop. And I'm sure Dave's got the figures at his fingertips. Whenever we debate, we end up debating residential care. We end up debating numbers of residential care beds that we need. We end up debating residential care. And it's almost as if residential care is the social care acute sector. It is huge and expensive, and we actually find it really quite difficult to, to shift it. And I have one last point. The other thing that we were really very concerned about, we were very concerned about the allocation of money. Just uh, when I was vice president, and Peter Smallridge was president, Peter Smallridge was the director of social services in Kent, and he had 4,000 beds and nursing homes in his area. I was director of social services in Hammersmith and Fulham. I had six beds and one home. He got the largest slice of social security money. I got the smallest. So how the, how the resources played out across local authorities was very uneven, and you inherited a sector in existence. This wasn't a, here's a blank sheet of paper, go out and create it. We inherited facilities and services. <coughs> And how to ensure accountability was one of the things that was really uh, on the agenda at the time. And very particularly, how can you, in this new contracting environment, because that's what it was, do you keep the end user in mind? Because so many people said to me when I was a regulator, my service is more accountable to the council than to me. And what we did was replace the monopoly provider with a monopsony purchaser. And actually, the power of that monopsony is, you know, you've just got one big purchaser. And you might have had one big provider, you've now got one big purchaser. We have an increase of self-funders who can buy services direct, but we still have one big purchaser. And as Richard said, if you only ever purchase or commission the things you use to provide, how you actually get those individuals to really influence the design of services is still uh, something that really has to be cracked in the social care market, which is imperfect. And policymakers need to decide what level of imperfection do you want in this market, because you're not letting it be a pure market. Grace, thank you very much. Um, well, having had a bit of history, David, 
or what have been the successes and failures since? Okay. All right, thanks. Um, I don't know what Phil's going to say, because by the time we get to him, everybody will have said all the figures. But um, anyway, um, <laughs> um, what strikes me is that I think um, picking up on some of those messages of history and Denise's reminder about the uh, changes in the 93 Act, it strikes me that um, <coughs> social care has been in the vanguard of the way that public services have been modernising. So the push into individualism, the push into uh, uh, purchase provider separations, etc., and has in many ways pioneered uh, what some of that uh, uh, has looked like at a local level. Seaborne departments were set up largely as experiments in 74. I'd argue that actually the development of markets have largely been an exercise in experimentation and discovery, not of what to do, but how this is to be done and how it's to be shaped. And the successes, uh, I think, are, are numbers, and the, the failures, because this isn't a, a story of unalloyed success, as I think both Richard and Denise have touched on. So, I'm going to say three things about successes, three things about challenges, and uh, a couple of things about um, what the medium-term financial outlook might mean to just how constrained <coughs> or otherwise is choice as we move forward. So, just on the successes, um, I think from the story that Richard and Denise have told about the amount of provision and the, uh, um, uh, the distribution of that provision, I think... Um, uh, patterns of provision have emerged at a local level which are very different in 2012 in terms of their incidence, the number of them, than they were in 93, in 83 and previously. Um, and very often they've responded to local circumstances and I want to argue that local authorities have managed the issues around market entry and market exit well over that period of time. I'll say something about Southern Cross in a minute. but. Um, it seems to me that the history uh, uh, of this, um, and there have been a number if I, uh, of, of recessions in uh, the care market. Denise's point about small independent providers using this as a pension pot and then coming out of it led to uh, a decrease in the number of places available. That's largely been replaced. So last year, 2010, um, we had a net increase in care home capacity measured by beds of over uh, 4,600 beds. But we had a net change in care home capacity men measured by homes of 105. And that was, uh, I think that uh, pattern will have been continued um, last year. So every single year since 2006, what's been going on is a net increase in beds in the system and a net decrease in homes in the system. So capacity has been coming in. Oh, I might say, want to ask later who's been commissioning those beds. But by the same, at the same time, um, beds have been exiting. So again last year, um, uh, I think uh, uh, over 1,000 beds went out of the system, a uh, number. So market entry and exit has been managed at a local level uh, very much by um, local authorities. Uh, I haven't got the figures to my fingertips in terms of domiciliary care, but um, uh, we've seen more market entry in relation to domiciliary care. But in spite of that, uh, this is still a highly fragmented and fractured market. So we've still got 90% of all uh, <coughs> providers have only one or two homes. And something like the top 10 providers still have less than 10% of the uh, market. So this is still a highly fragmented market. And the domiciliary care element of this is even more fragmented. Um, so whilst we've had uh, the growth in the independent sector over a period of time, uh, the pattern of that provision uh, substantially is pretty much un unaltered. Um, slightly against that point, and picking up on uh, Richard's point around innovation, um, uh, we have seen entering the market, particularly around domiciliary care, particularly around small and medium-sized enterprises on the back of uh, direct payments and individual <coughs> budgets, an increase in the range of not-for-profit, mutuals, uh, micro-enterprises which are supporting uh, individuals that are purchasing their own care and making their own arrangements. Um, so while substantially the market shape hasn't altered, there have been changes um, as that innovation has come. I'm absolutely with Richard. I haven't seen any innovation that's been commissioned in. I think the innovation has come from providers seeking to do things in different ways and uh, the demand from people wanting direct payments and individual budgets is being stifled at the minute by an absence of supply of services that will help uh, people to make those individual choices and uh, be more in control of the uh, services. 
I'd want to echo the point that Denise made about uh, choice and control, uh, about um, there have been increases in individual budgets and direct payments. It has been glacial, as, um, as Richard said. But interestingly, I think more people do have choice, and the research which has been done on people who procure their own care using direct payments and individual budgets shows that satisfaction rates for those individuals are far in excess in comparison with satisfaction rates of any traditional services. They don't uh, come across as being cheaper, but uh, in terms of value for money, the satisfaction per pound spent is greater than any other, other services. Um, which is why uh, we've, uh, uh, in government, when Phil was minister and current ministers, continue to push uh, into the use of direct payments and personal budgets as being uh, a way that choice can be demonstrated. So uh, there were the uh, three successes. Uh, there are more, but time doesn't allow. In terms of challenges, um, local authorities are largely commissioning or purchasing on uh, cost and volume. Uh, we've lost procuring uh, commissioning on uh, outcomes and quality. Uh, we're dangerously in a race to the bottom uh, in relation to quality. And uh, there is a substantial <coughs> challenge, I think, to the way that services are commissioned that we need to respond to. And we've talked about this for a long time, but we really do need to shift the local authority role uh, from directly purchasing care into one that facilitates a wider market for the whole population. We've still got uh, care markets which are pretty much organised in blocks of residential and domiciliary with a small array of uh, social enterprises uh, trying to provide choice for people who want to uh, make their own arrangements for care. And the market uh, 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 creating and facilitating a wider market role at a local level is an essential part of uh, the local authority role in our view <coughs> moving forward. There needs to be more collaborative arrangements between local authorities. Uh, authorities here in London which are very close together serving a population do little to collaborate about how to make markets and actually create um, uh, how to share the risk and create innovation. And um, uh, I, I'm personally of the view that new skills are needed. I, I think if I went back to work in a local authority to do these things properly instead of just talk about them then I think one of the first things I'd do is actually make sure I'd got about half a dozen really good analysts that could actually drive a conversation at a local level based on data, not on rhetoric and emotion, which is a lot of uh, how these debates get conducted. So I think new skills are required to do this. Um, we do need um, to um, uh, continue and then conclude the debate, which I think has been highlighted by Southern Cross about whether there's a greater need for market oversight. Um, Southern Cross really did precipitate some hugely important questions about um, uh, service continuity and uh, the risks associated, particularly with large providers. And I draw that distance. It's why I began with a point about market entry and exit has largely been very well managed over uh, the past 20 odd years by local authorities. <coughs> I think what we were confronted with, and Peter, I have to say, was absolutely fantastic in the way that he led uh, that local solution from ADAS in relation to Southern Cross. Uh, what it's precipitated is when you've got uh, failure over a larger scale that is beyond individual local authorities, there is actually a need for some greater uh, collaboration across uh, the piece. But the real issues around Southern Cross, and, and remember this isn't finished yet, there is still a legal entity called Southern Cross, which, um, so the whole set of the legal process isn't yet concluded, um, raises some uh, issues about the complex financial structures which exist in relation to funding care, and um, uh, that has made the challenges of resolving those issues uh, even more challenging. There's a number of other services which um, service continuity is an essential issue of uh, private capital being involved. Um, it's not an option that we don't have water. It's not an option we don't have electricity, for instance. And uh, having continuity on back of those public services where there are private investors is a, a hugely important issue, and Southern Cross uh, precipitated that. Um, it also raises some pretty important issues about accountability. Um, I uh, got to go to uh, answer the government, uh, uh, state the government's position at the Public Accounts Committee to Margaret Hodge, whose question was, why isn't government doing more to stop things like Southern Cross? And it's very interesting 
uh, about where you've got a market set up, I thought, by a Labour government. Um, how um, the questions then about who's accountable for resolving this. Uh, Kieran, you better answer it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, one of the paradoxes of uh, the I position we're living in is a desire to get more plurality and set up markets, and then an issue about once you've set up markets, still holding government accountable for when those markets fail. Wait, but um, Stephen Dorham. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a number. Um, oh, but anyway, I'm sure um, I'm happy to. But yeah, yeah. People might argue that Southern Cross was a success. I mean, no homes closed, nobody got thrown out. Well, I do yeah. want to, what, I would argue uh, uh, that a number of people work very, very hard. A number of people in this room work very, very hard. Peter's performance was uh, quite outstanding in my view. And um, I thought government worked very well with those to ensure that Southern Cross uh, was resolved without taxpayers' money being spent and continuity being secured for those services. A very interesting issue, if we had a failure regime, would a failure regime stepped in earlier and taxpayers' money would have been used and we might not have had the service continuity. There's a huge paradox about just thinking <laughs> through where we go in terms of service continuity regimes given that experience. But is it acceptable then to say next time it happens, uh, a bunch of people will get together, uh, the department will lead some activity at a national level, ADAS will lead it at a local level, and it will work out all right. In effect, what we did is run a continuity regime, an insolvency regime. If this had been a private company, it would have been wound up. No two ways about it, it would have been wound up. The only reason it wasn't wound up is significant decisions were taken about service continuity and the need for people who were in services to end up in other services, even though the ownership might have changed as a result of that. <coughs> now, I would also argue that a number of market entry and exit issues in Southern Cross were kept artificially alive during that period, so it was a bigger company that it needed to be. So in a sense, what uh, we did is keep it alive, Chai's here, and those people that are now running these services have got to make some hard decisions about uh, the viability of some of those services and whether they needed and at the local level. some of it should have closed. So, it, uh, absolutely my point, yeah. So um, that, uh, I, I think, is where I'd go. But it, but it raises issues around, should you have market oversight? Who should take the role? What is the role of government in that? What is the role of the sector? Uh, who is accountable for the, these things? What is the role of local authority commissioners in relation to this? Because um, uh, we're heading for over 50% of people procuring their own care, being self-funders. Uh, as more of us go with equity into our old age, the uh, number of us that are making these arrangements, we're currently at about 40%. In West Sussex, it's about 90% of all people in care homes in West Sussex are self-funders. Mm -hmm. That's been a big change. That's a huge change in the way that people will make decisions. Richard exposed the point about whether people are making good decisions because they don't have the information to inform the decisions that they need to make. So we run the risk of people making individual purchasing decisions, which are bad ones because they're not assisted to make that, hence the importance of information. So some really important issues uh, around uh, uh, the markets. Uh, how do we uh, strive for continuous improvement to be the third point under the challenges? What changes are needed uh, so we can ensure we deliver high uh, quality care? What's the responsibility of providers? What's the responsibility of commissioners? What is government's responsibility? So these issues around information and advice, workforce development, uh, how do we drive quality? What are the issues around um, integration are key issues? On the medium term financial outlook, uh, just um, some thought. I, th I think I've heard William Lang quote a figure that um, the plurality of the market has resulted in between 30 and 40 billion pounds of capital being invested in this sector over uh, the past 20 or so years. Um, if you add up all the capital grants that local authority, uh, that government has given to local authorities uh, over that period of time, I don't think you'd dent that figure, quite frankly. So one of the paradoxes, uh, again, that we need to tease through is um, how do we uh, get capital into these markets so we can drive improvements in quality, etc. Is that going to come uh, from the market? A lot of equity providers still see um, this sector as being an attractive place to invest in spite of what the markets are doing at the minute. The demographics are strong. There's rising numbers of self-funders. They've got equity which is sitting behind them. This debate about the difference between income and wealth. Um, Personalisation and direct payments means we are going to get a, a more empowered set of consumers eventually. 
So this is still an attractive sector for uh, people looking to make long-term in investments. Uh, how is that going to be harnessed and taken forward? But there are some quite serious and significant short-term pressures. Uh, a number of companies are still highly indebted. There's little uh, potential to absorb current cost pressures. Um, uh, the issues around commissioning and uh, the volumes that are in the system uh, for commissioning <coughs> are key to this. There's a downward pressure on local authorities funding which they pass on in terms of fees, fixed costs are rising, so this is a, a perfect storm waiting to happen in relation to these issues. Um, what have we been doing since uh, we continue to have conversations with the largest providers, particularly those with debt, about how are they managing the challenges that they face, what's the confidence that they've got, how robust are they as organisations in terms of their clinical governance of standards, etc., which is so important. But what's the composition of their boards in terms of their own financial restructuring? Do they have financial restructuring experts that are mentioned on their boards? Or have they just collected the great and the good who can open doors? Actually, one of the issues around Southern Cross, perhaps, is they had too many people that could open doors and not enough people with the technical knowledge to actually restructure the business in the way it needed to be restructured. So, yeah. that's me. Yeah. Okay. Um, Keep it reasonably short, that would help. Well, so um, sort of I'll do it bullet point style. Five challenges. Um, for me, um, who, who drives what shape of the market? Um, we started, as Denise very ably outlined, with a state-driven, top-down market force. And we are now in a position where the emphasis is on the customer driving the market uh, through choice and control. Those produce two very different things, but we've never been clear of that. And in that, we've always fought, we've, we've talked about the driver, but we've been very reluctant to talk about the word market. Uh, and I've always taken the view that if it quacks and it waddles, it's duck. Um, and markets do all sorts of things. We need to understand investment, for example. And we've not really followed through <coughs> what we meant by markets. Uh, William, who was my co-lead in the engagement exercise and I on markets, we had a very interesting experience <laughs> last year. When we mentioned the word markets to social care audience, it went like this one. It didn't ripple at all. We went into a room in which there was any member of the NHS and a riot <laughs> ensued for about two hours before we could get any calm to say what we meant by it. Um, so really that word in itself provokes a range of emotions rather than actually an analysis of what are we doing in relation to, to the market and what are we trying to achieve. And therefore we've not always been explicit about to what end. Denise again outlined the big drivers of efficiency and value for money uh, as well as a bit of shape that were there and behind. Uh, in current, we're trying to get choice and control. Again, what to what end, really? We've also, I think, and particularly in the engagement exercise, we've been really clear uh, that there's not one social care market. There is not a homogenous social care market. Uh, people who are using individual budgets came up with, I want a life, not a service, and started to do really radical things, like buy karate classes or football season tickets, because they wanted meaningful activities, not a daycare centre. Uh, they really challenged us with what existed outside of a traditional market. And we've been pointing to the interface with our whole range of markets, whether that's those kind of community and existing markets, whether it's housing, or whether it's at the other end, the healthcare and acute care markets. Um, so actually it's about how you straddle a whole range of markets. Um, and I think importantly, it's not just state provision. Even in areas which I'm, I've been in Sussex today, I've been at West Sussex, East Sussex, Brighton <laughs> and Surrey, I've got to get them all right or else I shall be killed by the one I miss. Um, I've been at their care show and found indeed some of the, I know some others were there too, a really impressive collaboration in an area where you're right, 80% is self-funded and in reform if we're just talking about state funding we're going to miss a very, very big trick. Indeed Birmingham as, as experience was our work highlighted that if we didn't think about self-funding we certainly couldn't be thinking about the shape of the market, that actually self-funding was driving it. So it's never been an issue about just the state funded element and neither should it be as we consider the future. And my final challenge is I think we've really been reluctant <coughs> to identify the right spaces and roles for each other. If you think commissioning can provide innovation, show me somebody sitting in a room doing a contract that can drive the detail of your business. Innovation is the provider's concern, just as quality should be, and commissioning contracts, purchasing, pricing should be about pipelines that help you do those things. And when we've talked in the other way around and got it the wrong way around, got ourselves into all trouble. And equally, it's really interesting tracking back Denise's history. Commissioning is but an infant. It is still in, I think it's still in primary schooling. 
It's got a long way to learn, it's, it, 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 and we should give it that ability. We sometimes expect it to be masters educated in terms of competence and performance when it's only a few years old. Uh, and we need to continue to evolve it towards that total place, uh, whole markets approach that I think David so ably outlined. Very quickly, some successes. At the very time uh, where Denise was being president, I waddled into my first senior area job and I waddled into a closed fisherman's care home. There you go. Where my office, uh, which not only had a very strange odour, uh, was, <laughs> was, was previously the room of four gentlemen. At the back of it was a single room that the single man walked through the other four beds uh, to get to. The opposite side of the corridor was a room shared by six gentlemen, of which was a room shared by a pair, and in the middle was the single bathroom and toilet shared by all of them. That was only at the back end of the 1980s. When I moved to Birmingham, this man here was reminding Birmingham that it might be a good idea to have some privacy in the toilet facilities and the care homes it ran by putting some screens in the way. <laughs> you know, those were sort of the basic issues. We were still, we were closing large institutions, a large mental hospital at the back end of Lincolnshire was one of the first things we did at the end of the 80s. We have come a very long way and that huge investment that David outlined isn't just about flashy buildings. And if you look at where Birmingham is now to where it was a decade ago, I would argue that capital investment is about buildings that are sensitive to dementia, is about buildings that do not commode people in the middle of their bedroom. And there's a, that some of the dignity that goes with that is essential, and we've got to have that right infrastructure. We'd never have done that on public money, and we don't celebrate that enough. Secondly, I would argue it's an enormously diverse market. Despite actually the predominance of block contracting, mm. it is incredibly diverse with, uh, hang on, it's down here, 22,000 organisations near enough uh, as employers. And it would be interesting to see whether the competition that arises from customer choice, because my A-level in economics uh, says that that drives monopoly markets, would, would, will again manage to lead that diversity. And I think we need to be working out what are the things that enable us to keep the right shapes, the right choices. Because, uh, of course, people respond to his intense competition by consolidating. Uh, my third success um, is a bit of a challenge back to those that think that personalisation has been a little steady. The second biggest workforce sector are personal assistants. They are now 14%. They've knocked councils out of automatic promotion into third place in the employment table. That has been a quite understated and often unacknowledged revolution in the size and shape of the workforce. I think we've got a long way to go with personal budgets because we've got to give people who are dementing, who are the majority purchaser of state care, who I think may have trouble controlling money, if I work out if I know enough about dementia, the same choice and control as those exercising individual budgets and holding direct payments. And that is, I think, the really big challenge lying ahead uh, for us. But given that huge success of the quiet revolution, I'm confident about it. And my final success is I think there's a lot of success that this sector doesn't want to herald. We did blog at Christmas that at one point it did seem like the argument was that 1.5 million people came to work to somehow abuse the people in their care. Actually, I believe the reverse is true, that despite the fact that the law is bust and antiquated, despite the fact that the financial system is under great strain, there are fantastic examples, everybody's got them in the room, of really great care. There's not enough, and it's not consistent enough, and the system is capable of better. But actually, I believe it's still motivated by people with the right values in the right place. And the best example of that for all is my father-in-law, who's been uh, fantastically well looked after and has recovered his social ability, albeit that his body is completely broken to pieces. Um, the great highlight of that for me was when the care home starts to talk about taking out his catheter. That means more work, more effort to achieve his dignity. And I think people who have monitored and do, do care in that kind of way are actually the real successes of it, and I'm really pleased you still find that an experience. I'd like to see that more consistently, more, more everywhere, and promoted by the law and the financial system, which I'm sure David is working on as we speak. <laughs> right. Finally, and uh, I'll be, I will, and I will be brief and succinct. I, I, a couple of thoughts from me. I, I think that the, the social care market is a very, very large and diverse market, and um, in a way. Um, it surprises me in that sense that well, there's not a problem of entry to the market because there are so many uh, providers 
in it. I think there is a problem about exit from the market. And although, David, I know you said you thought that was being managed, well, I'm, I'm anxious, and I, I was anxious at the time, that uh, we were perpetuating providers in the market that weren't providing the kind of quality that we needed, and the market wasn't dealing with it in a way that I would have anticipated the market would have done. Now, I think uh, the points that have been made about personal budgets and direct payments may assist in that uh, direction, but it does require people, and I think this is what is absent from the system, is having the information to make informed choices. I mean, you need to have a diversity of provision out there to choice, choose between in a social care market, but you also need to know what's out there, what its cost is, how it compares to others. And for people who are um, uh, entering into an older life with, with dementia, it may not just be the individual, it'll be their families as well. And I think uh, we put a lot of emphasis around information and advice. And, and I remember thinking at the time when we were writing the, the white paper building a national care service, why all this emphasis on information and advice? It doesn't, you know, that's not providing a service to somebody. But of course, in a market, that's exactly what you require. Without that, people aren't making informed choices. The providers haven't got that pressure from the customer, who is an informed customer, uh, to, uh, uh, to change their practice or uh, to do whatever they need to do in the market to provide better services. That's my first point. The second point is um, I'm pretty convinced that the market is massively under-resourced and underfunded, which is why we've got this drive, as you put it, rather succinctly, David, you know, down to uh, uh, poor quality uh, provision. And now, um, uh, looking back on the politics of that over the last, say, 10 years, I think uh, whilst there were extra resources provided for social care, I think the NHS did grab the political attention and therefore did grab the bulk of the resources that were uh, available. And social care did get its, uh, some of the share of that growth, but didn't get it in proportion to the way that the NHS certainly did. Um, and I remember the, the battles that we had to try and get the political attention from uh, 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 <coughs> Prime Ministers and uh, Cabinet members for the importance of the social care agenda as opposed to the NHS uh, agenda. And, and of course the irony of that is that if uh, uh, we, we underfund the social care system, it puts enormous pressures on the NHS. And so there is a real need, an absolute right need right now in going forward with an ageing population to create that integration between the two because it's the social care solutions that are going to provide the solutions to the NHS problems that at the moment are being looked at in the acute system. But we've got to get people looked after more in their own home. We've got to reduce admissions to hospital. We've got to reduce readmissions. We've got to provide that care in people's homes. That's a lot of the work I'm doing at the moment. Kieran Brett and I have set up a company called Improving Care and we're developing a social impact bond with particularly that idea in place, external investment. Uh, driven through ri rigorous performance management and contractual relationships that will actually mean people are prevented from going to hospital and the savings in the NHS that, that, that accrues from that then funds the, the growth in, in, in the ageing population. And it's not just a UK a problem. The work we're doing with Imperial, uh, uh, Aradazi and the, the Global Health Institute there, with a, a, a forum on ageing and health is saying this is not just a problem for the UK, this is a problem uh, the way the social care market works and how that works with other, um, uh, the NHS in our country, other uh, care providers in other countries. How do you deal with that if you've got that uh, uh, pr pressure of an ageing uh, population? Because the system will simply fall over yeah. unless we find the resources and put them in the right place and reshape both health and social care, one being the means to reshaping the other. Without that, I don't think uh, things will be uh, successful. Um, I'll point to one particular success on personal budgets. The reason why personal budgets did grow so much uh, towards the end of the last administration was the Transforming Social Care Grant was a very, very clear way of putting money in the system for a particular purpose that did allow councils to get that double running that they needed to do to generate the new ways of working whilst having to maintain existing ways of working. That is one of the key problems I think that we face going forward is how you <coughs> resource and double run services whilst one lot are changing into another. I don't think a market solves that problem. I think government has to play a role in that or else the fragmentation will work against the integration that is absolutely required across the health and social care systems. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Do raise a hand and ask a question. Um, Hi, good evening. I'm uh, uh, Adam Sharples. I'm Director of Policy for WHICH. Um, until recently, I was responsible for commissioning welfare to work programs in DWP. So <laughs> have that perspective on all of this. One of the fundamental problems with any commissioned service is how you ensure quality 
uh, when people are competing and ultimately trying to make a profit out of delivering the service. In some areas, it is possible to pay by results, and so you're using that pressure to try and drive up quality. That's really difficult in a social care context. And so there are pretty fundamental problems about quality being driven down yeah. as people struggle to, you know, private providers struggle to make a commercial uh, uh, go of it, um, which just today has published some research on domiciliary care and the really poor standards received uh, by people there. So what I'm interested in is your views on how in a commissioning environment the right dynamic can be set up in which customers are driving up quality through informed choice rather than quality being driven down as people try and make a profit. Yeah, thanks. So, I mean, we'll, there's another bit to that question, says, isn't there? In, in the what has led to the quality improvement there has been, it's probably not been commissioning, it may have been inspection. I think, I just want to say a couple of things in relation to that. One is, <coughs> commissioning as a word means whatever the person saying it means at that minute. If I knew that there was some sort of agreement around what commissioning is, I might be able to respond to that. I remember standing on a platform talking about local authority commissioning alongside somebody talking about NHS commissioning. The definition in the NHS was commissioning is about I have a finite budget and what am I going to spend it on this year and how am I going to pin it down and how am I going to know what I get. The local authority commissioning was what is the sort of place I want to encourage my geographical community to be and how can I encourage a sufficiency of supply even if I don't buy it? So I, I think you know, commissioning can mean all sorts of things and I think it's, it's, really, it's really helpful for people to try and unpick it. Yeah. Um, as you know, I'm now at Hello Care Providers Alliance, I'm now a red tape champion for the independent sector um, looking at the, the government's current red tape, tape challenge on the review of regulation. We brought in quality ratings as a commission in the teeth of major opposition. Having come back three years on, those quality ratings having been abolished, um, the big core from the sector, and I can see nods, is we want the quality ratings back. Want it back with a real user perspective around what quality means. And the reason that the sector is saying it wants them back, they don't want them back how we brought them in, but they want them back in some form, is it was a spur to improve within the, their own company, their own business, their own corporate organization. So you could actually write it into the performance targets of individuals. We want all of our services to be at this level of quality, which is why you have to have a user input because quality is very subjective. But one of our reasons for bringing them in was that if you had a quality rating, you had some chance of getting quality and cost closer together. So if you were a higher quality rated, you didn't have to take the minimum price you could go in. And what I noticed, that, that, that just the small time that we were having the quality rating scheme, the people that got maximum quality opted straight out of local authority contracts and started to sell direct. And what was resulting in was medium quality was being commissioned on block contracts. And one of the things which CSCI used to do was feed back to local authorities, you know, this is the level of quality that you're contracting. We used to chirpy, we used to give information to local authorities so they could actually think that through and then a local authority might decide to work with those people with whom they had contracts to improve the quality of what they were providing. And that was where the information of the inspectorate was used for improvement. It wasn't that the inspectorate did the improvement, but it gave the information for those people who could. And I, and I think it's really quite interesting, my coming back after three years, finding that the sector really wants a benchmark of quality. Because if everybody is just assessed as being compliant or regulated at the minimum, then you have no idea as a consumer 
who is actually better than the average. Yeah, but that's kind of essential for consumers, isn't it? I mean, yes. any, anyone it's information. Kind of a relative going into any of this, you have yeah. no idea how yeah, to assess the policy exactly. which you think you're going to be buying. Information. Absolutely. Really difficult. And, and Nick, I would argue that actually it's the tier below the commissioners where the quality determines. Was actually your immediate response was a tier above even further and remoter in inspection. I think what we've seen in the personal budgets is people taking control for their own quality and that's one of the big reasons mm -hmm. driving their improved satisfaction and indeed better outcomes that are coming from it. Um, I think there's a real issue, if Commissioner, I'm with Denise, is, is all of those, those things, it is about sufficiency and shape. Yeah. Um, actually, how do you lock in to the choice? I've never procured or commissioned a provider in the place on the basis that they're pretty crap. Um, mm -hmm. The people we get working in our place are usually pretty good and they meet all the tests. But the lock-in about the support planning arrangements is a, is a social work decision. And we've put, we haven't put enough time into how we lock down the line of sight between commissioning and the buying of that support plan. We've not got that right for state funded. We don't even have that offer for um, the non-state funded. And one of the reasons we've joined the social work pilot to stand social work on its head is I think that advocacy, brokerage, uh, individual consumer help, whatever you call it, should be something that people spending an awful lot of money on their own care should be wanting to buy. So I think it's about the tier below that sufficiency, how helping you with managing that quality, that it works for you in the right way. Just on, kind of just up to Adam's point, I'll, I'll do this quickly. I think it's about relationships, stupid. And actually what we're talking about now are fractures and fragmentations between the key relationships of the people that need to actually do it. So the, the privilege of the job I do at the minute, having been, uh, worked in social services uh, to deliver services, then done the inspectorate job with Denise and now into this job, is, um, and I'm prompted by, look, I spent part of today looking at Winterbourne and having thought about, uh, some people in the room will remember long care. And um, long care was the abuse of some people in a learning disability home in Berkshire, I think, in the mid 90s. Yep. And actually Winterbourne is almost identical to it. Yep. And same, same abuse techniques. So what happened in that period of time that nothing has changed? Why is it we don't do what we know we need to do? I think to, for me some of that is... That, that was rhetorical. No, no, but I, no it, isn't, <laughs> it isn't for me rhetorical. I think it's because people, people have the language of purchasing and contracting, which I talked about where we started, uh, went into things called commodities and currency. You'd meet lots of people in the NHS who talked about commodities and currency and what's the currency for this, that and the other. What we got out of was commissioning, however we define that word, an affirmative culture. What is it? I mean, what, what was happening in Winterbourne is what Irving Goffman identified happened in asylums in the 1940s. There was a power relationship that was abused. And so it's, how, do you, how do you commission for the sort of culture you want to generate rather than the physical circumstances of the politics. Well, I guess a child's question, that must be even harder in domiciliary. Can I just finish what I was going to say? Sorry, uh, because I, I do want to land this point. I, I'll give way to Chai. But, um, so, Adam, the way I've been thinking about this now, uh, in this job rather than in the other jobs, is I think there's five drivers to quality. Uh, and this is, and uh, firstly, there is how the commissioners commission. I'll take this point about definition. But actually, there's a provider responsibility about making sure the quality of the service that they offer is right. There's a clinical governance responsibility about the quality standards that it's run to. Uh, last time I provided services, we talked about a duty of care that people had to the people that they cared for. I think there's a professional responsibility. Actually, I defy any professional, whether they've done seven years to become a doctor, or just done the lifting and handling techniques, not to know that hitting somebody is not an offence. That isn't actually a higher form of science, it's actually an assault. Uh, so there's a professional responsibility. Remember there was a, a winter boy and other psychiatrist that was on site. This is my point about clinical governance in organisations. Um, the fourth one is regulation. You cannot regulate quality into a service. And yet CQC were blamed for the absence of quality in a service. You can't regulate it in. It's got to be commissioned in and then provided in and the professionals have got to accept responsibility. And then lastly, coming to your question, um, I think the voice of people that use services and Peter's point about and those people that don't have capacity and that's a winter but need to be prominent. And the picture I've got in my head is a graphic equaliser and if you have any one of them out of any kind of balance, you're not going to get quality in that service. 
And the trick is to get them all flicking along in a level so that you are getting those influences. So when we go, uh, service quality has failed and it's a commissioner's fault, a service quality has failed and it's a provider's fault, there's a number of checks and balances that need to be in a system. So I would answer your question by attending to the system and making sure that you are designing a system where, uh, coming back to one of the things that Peter said, people are absolutely clear about what their roles and responsibilities are and they discharge them. That for me is one of the failures of people forgetting what their roles and responsibilities are. Jai Patel, I'm the chairman of HD1, one of the companies that was born out of the Southern Cross situation. Some observations and a couple of questions. I think um, to, to the last gentleman about profitability, and I think it's Des, I think, who asked the question, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the profitability in, uh, in uh, domiciliary care particularly is now almost down to something like 5 to 10% on margin. And, and it's being driven down intensely with the way uh, domiciliary care has been commissioned. So some of the roots of the issues you might get in domiciliary care are built into the way it's procured. I won't use the term commission the way it's procured. The second thing, observation I would make after 25 odd years in the industry almost from the beginning is there's a very poor relationship between people who supply and produce services in this sector and the people who want to consume them uh, or buy them on, on behalf of the, the citizens. And that relationship needs to be improved materially. And one of the ways it can improve is, is not by uh, commissioners or purchasers thinking they know what they want, but to actually ask the questions of what could be provided. And that way, the suppliers can come up with ideas that you could then see whether you can afford or whether you think they're appropriate to your budgets and what you're trying to do. There's a whole range of ideas out there that, procure, uh, that providers have to help with the interface of health and social care, to use the current envelope of buildings across the countries that are being used for social care to redevelop them into a whole new innovative way of providing community-based services with greater clinical and, and uh, greater innovations around mechanics and, and digital solutions and so on that could be done but somebody needs to meet them somewhere and say here's a revenue stream the best thing one of the ex-secretary uh, of states who i won't mention because he was a chatham house rule said to me the other day uh, when i met him he says if i knew what how the private sector worked when i was a, a secretary of state i would have done things differently and what i've learned by being in the private sector is the private sector responds to revenue so if you put out a revenue, it will respond to it. You just need to say there's some funding here and they will come up with ideas. I think it's a complete misnomer, I can tell you this, and then on my question, that the reason why things happen badly in any sector is because of profit. They happen badly because people do bad things and they're managed and governed badly and because the system can never protect against the mad and the bad. So you really need to get that sorted out. That is the way it is. What has happened at Winterbourne is just unacceptable human behavior. You cannot judge the whole sector by that. It's just unacceptable. There's an enormous amount of amazing things happening. And my final point is, if you really want quality in the sector, quality does cost. And we're doing residential care for 75 pounds a night. You can't stay in a travel lodge for 75 pounds a night. And we've now reduced domiciliary care down to six pounds 50 an hour. And we're now trying to do this where the minimum wage is almost higher than the rate you're paying and you're doing 15 minute visits for five minute travel times on a map that you know shows that the travel time is more than 10 minutes and then you wonder why the interface between the provider of the care and the person who wants to receive the care is poor. So the question is, if you really want what you want, then please put it out properly so that people can respond to it appropriately. It isn't about profit. And if you really think all the not-profit organizations in the world are going to deliver this service, it's just not going to happen because the not-for-profits are not going to find the capital. There is no capital other than in the private sector unless you want tax-based capital from governments. That's a whole different way to solve the problem. Well, I, I suppose well, one of the issues I'd like to pick up is the issue about financial incentives in the social care market, because I'm not sure we have got the financial incentives right, and they're certainly not linked to outcomes that uh, individuals who receive social care um, uh, you know, uh, across. Now, I wonder whether there is uh, some thinking needing to be done about outcome-led commissioning that puts the financial incentives in the right place for the individual who, who reports something about their care, and if it's better care, uh, the, the provider gets rewarded if it's worse care they don't and then manage that market in a way 
that we drive up quality. Um, I still think there's a fundamental problem about underfunding in the system, which is why we're getting the kind of behaviour you're describing. And I think that's a wider political decision that we tried to address and failed, and the current government is trying to address, and we'll see what, what they come up with. And I think we need to find new ways of getting money into the system. And it may be true, David, that the self-funders going into the system going forward will provide that, that resource, because people might be prepared to pay for their care if it's good quality. But uh, without knowing uh, one, one of your, your fifth uh, measure was uh, uh, what people think about the care they're receiving, if we made that far more prominent, and I like this idea of patient reported outcome measures in the NHS outcomes framework, for example, if that were part of the commissioning, data-led, outcome-led uh, commissioning by social care providers, and then uh, that would leave the provider the freedom to be innovative to meet those outcomes and incentivised to do so, not only by the financial incentives being in the right place, but by the voice of the, the, the consumer being able to influence uh, the market by the choices they make. Denise, you... Yes, there were a couple of things I wanted to say. I used to think that one of the most innovative things that a commissioner could do was actually get a large assembly hall, provide the tea and biscuits, invite the public and the providers and facilitate the direct conversation. Because that actually, that's what providers need to hear, is directly from the people who want to receive services and there needs to be that direct dialogue and you can then take the information and use it differently but not acting as an intermediary or an interpreter of the one to the other but actually facilitating some of that direct uh, contact. Uh, and the second thing I wanted to say was um, the, the work, doing some work with Phil in, in, in the Global Health Innovation Unit. I have come across this global um, domiciliary care franchise which I met, first of all, in the States, and which is, at that time, was in Japan, Australia, Ireland, and whatever. And I discovered that they are now in the UK. And so I looked up the franchise at the weekend and discovered that there were five franchises near where I lived in Cheshire, within reasonable distance. Then I looked where they were in London, and they're in outer London boroughs and probably the more affluent area. I dare say they're not going for any contracts whatsoever, but they are a global franchise with a global brand and they're going direct to the self-funders. And they're providing a mix of what they call companionship services, helper services, and personal care services. And it's, you know, we'll ring you up and remind you when your daughter's birthday is. We'll do all sorts of companionship type things. So actually, we have dealt with corporates in a residential care sector who have an obvious presence. A franchise isn't obvious. They'll be registered as individual units, but they're there. Mm. And you know, we don't necessarily know about them at this minute. I think to answer Chaya's question about how it goes out in the way, I just want to speak up a little bit for the confused middle. Because I don't think, and I, I'll take this as a personal confession, I'm not entirely sure I gave the clarity of leadership to get over the confusion. Because I know you're only meant to do one big transformational change. I'm trying to do three at once. I'm trying to reshape my organisation to do personalisation. And I have to be clear, I don't think there's any organisation where every member of staff fully believes that. I'm trying to, um, despite the fact that they've all been interviewed and selected on the basis of their competence for doing that. Uh, then I'm, on top of that, we're trying to reshape the market and all the offer that goes with it. And then we're now, to, now we've superimposed over the top of that, do that on a third less. And I had staff who I thought I'd appointed with the right compasses and the right beliefs who suddenly thought, Peter Hay will be back here next March, needing to pay his mortgage. I better go back to doing some old ways to make that budget matter more than anything else. Which one of those big three changes matters most? And I, I don't think we've got, and we are moving back to clarity that we might be able to do it through the methods of preventing and enablement. But I think particularly with the speed and shock of which the third out came, there, was, there were moments where lots of old behaviours and old ways of doing it reappeared alongside a new transformational method which wasn't deeply embedded enough to withstand that shock. I think we might be getting back to it. Um, uh, I can see signs of that, but I think we should acknowledge some of that real difficulty that people in the middle of organisations have had to face up to. I'm very conscious of time. So we're a quarter of an hour longer than we said we'd keep you in the first place, but we seem to be. So I'll keep going. I'll take, I'll take two more questions and then we'll... We'll finish. One there and one here. Uh, Shirley, as social care commentator, um, paradoxically, one of the things that I think Emma Harrison did get right, because I was listening to her at the ADSS conference, 
was asking the question, why are there 15 individuals involved in a care plan? And when we're looking at how health and care don't work together, and I was looking at the photo there and thinking, is that someone in health or someone in care? Um, the images we have, but I mean the barriers we've also got, is about too many people, services not connected. Denise mentioned about one franchise. I'm aware there's a many, many different services that are available, and I suppose I'd come back to Richard's question, why is the information and advice that is available so poor, and how can we use technology to actually promote social innovation? Because in a sense, Phil, when you were talking about the transition grant, sadly, a lot of it was wasted. Yeah. You know, 153 authorities developing RAS systems. So I'd like more collaboration. I agree with what you're saying, yeah. but we have technology as a black hole, and I'd like to know what you're going to do about it. Right. Can we take the second one to take the two questions together? Hi, Michael McDonald from the Institute of Global Health Innovation and Imperial, working with both Denise and Phil. Uh, I just wanted to be, uh, uh, both of you, in fact, I think Richard as well, cited commissioning as a, a sort of block to innovation. Uh, mm. it, it ends up being a commissioning more of the same. You don't, you know, it's a very hard thing to get out. But I'm wondering then whether we weren't radical enough and we should get much more radical about mm. markets, get rid of commissioning and go mm. much mm. more to a direct funded mm. model. Okay. Comments on those two. Could I comment yeah. on that? Yeah, I mean, I think we need to think much more out of the box. And I love this story. It doesn't have a rude word. It's about... Um, Nikita, Nikita Khrushchev, the, one of the late great uh, Soviet dictators who visited New York in the early 60s and was given a helicopter tour of Manhattan and he looked down on this seething mass of humanity and he said to his uh, uh, companion, "But who organises the bread for all these people? You know? um, and actually, if we were starting from first principles and we said, well, how do we organise bread for the people of London? We wouldn't ask Boris Johnson to do it, would we? <coughs> or Ken Livingstone. And I think sometimes we kind of assume that the only way things can happen is through local authorities yeah. doing things, yeah. through the Department of Health doing things. And maybe we need, to picking up Shirley's point, we need to make greater use of technology and social media to connect individuals that need care with people who can provide it in much more imaginative ways than we have done at the moment. And let's look at the two billion, I think it's two billion, that local authorities spend on assessment and care management, assessing fewer people to tell more and more of them that what they're not entitled to, and put some of that, I mean, what we spend on information advice is pitiful. So, and we wonder why the market doesn't work and we've got this, this, this big asymmetry. Um, can I just, sorry, I, want to say, I think the point about assessment is, uh, and assessments change, because after 12 <coughs> weeks, some of these conditions vary, and suddenly you go around the whole assessment routine again, and so there does become a lot of money being spent on continually asking somebody about how they are and what, what, what's happening to them, and not actually doing things to help them there and then uh, change. So I, 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 so I think there is an issue there about how assessments uh, are undertaken, and I would say there is a, a technical um, solution to some of those uh, questions, but they, things could be done quicker and faster using uh, technology, whether it's the actual processes of assessment, the information sharing that goes on between different parts of the system, the actual services that people get through telehealth and telecare, um, uh, and also, interestingly, the whole chip advisor thing that's been happening, uh, giving people information, I know it's controversial, but people are getting information about the providers uh, in a way that other sectors... Uh, the hotel market or the B&B &B market might use. Um, now, how does that play out? Now, I can see that there's going to be providers out there wanting to put these, uh, these forms of uh, immediacy in terms of interaction between the customer and the provider, which will almost be your people in a hall uh, um, that you were describing, Denise. It'll be done all, all, all on the internet. Now, that, I think that's going to happen very quickly. Uh, and if it does happen it does very quickly, it, it will yeah. change the market and it will be part of the, an information portal. Now, the only question I've got about that is the quality of the information, all the issues that go with that, and whether the government's got a role in creating better information portals, if that's the right word to use, that, that immediately put the, the, the service user in, in a relationship with the service, mm. the service provider. Um, uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. I yeah. just wanted to pick up the, yeah. the direct funding a little. And that, I think one of the things that happened uh, in the development of the market, as I described, is that um, providers in the market forgot they were in a market. If you only have to sell yourself to one big yes, purchaser, you yes. get very lazy. Quite so. And what people, what the market stopped doing, what providers stopped doing, was actually talking directly to lots of people mm. and, and actually saying what their wares were and explaining directly to the customer. I'll try to give you the last words. 
Um, the, uh, what, what the cancer source then forgot and were shocked about uh, was that actually people were buying their own care without any information and advice. Yeah. And one of the things that drove Birmingham early into the information advice thing was exactly members' realisation that people paying their own money uh, f were getting nothing from the state. Mm. So we did do assessment, we have tried to do it, but we've got an awful long way to go in there mm. for exactly the realisation that I think we came to this yeah, thing too late. One of the key roles could play. And I think, that, I think particularly if they're about the this breadth of view, not just a single market, mm. and they're about life courses they could do on that. And there are places, that there are a lot of people who deal away with it, do without commissioning, they're self-funders, and the evidence is they get the worst outcome. Mm. I do believe that commissioning has a role, but it's not at the front line. It's about the supply side, yeah. but, but being the pipeline to great things happening at the front, um, not the front edge, which can do it. But all the evidence is that for, for those who spend the most, their outcomes can actually sometimes be the worst. Um, distress purchasing and nobody helping shape that, that, that <coughs> provision is not a good outcome either. Yeah. David, last word. Um, so, so uh, Shirley, uh, nothing profound to say about it, but um, uh, again, one of the treats of doing the job that I do, you get out to speak to people, and uh, so I spoke to a group of people using personal budgets who use Facebook to trade hours, so my care assistant's off on Saturday morning, and has anybody got any help, I need to go to, I don't know, whatever I'm going to do on Saturday morning, and they were actually using, it wasn't going in and out of the council, it was going between yeah. them using Facebook. Um, quite inspiring stuff by in control and uh, yeah. harrow council shop for support where people are procuring yeah. so fantastic people um you know examples of people using innovation just to do business in a different way um any any flight uh, the past 10 flights i've bought have all been over the internet with i haven't had a conversation with anybody i've just gone on some people are now getting the care sorted out just by going on the shop for support uh, all power to harrow's elbow would be my view um it, uh, in, in terms of are we radical enough, what I was trying to say is I think local authorities need to concentrate on uh, developing their markets and uh, this is Peter's point about getting out of it. Um, so I think we are radical and I think person, the, the truly radical element of personal budgets is you actually are, if you think about it, uh, reducing the role of local authorities in commissioning by giving the power to the individuals. That's why I said to Adam, this, this is about relationships, stupid. So it is about a conversation. Peter himself did something a couple of weeks ago about how can we actually turn around a conversation with somebody about a service so it becomes about what they can do and how we can help people to do that instead of what they can't do and how we're going to compensate for them not doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, my mum's bed bound at the minute and needs 24 hour care. So that doesn't mean you supplant that and replace it. That stuff still needs doing and it's still as important as it ever was that it's done well and with dignity. But actually the game changer, H5% in 93 was a game changer for the way that the system operated. The game changer in my view today is actually a further drive around personalisation. Not in a blind way but actually what it's about is having different conversations with people about how they can be supported to live the lives that they want to live. In my mother's case at the minute, she wants to die at home. How do you actually organise those services so that can happen? It's not beyond our wit, quite frankly, to do it. Uh, but the big problem they've got is not can we get the right services going in, is uh, can they get her upstairs when she comes out of the hospital next week? You'll take three blokes and there's a row going on. Seriously. Actually, it's the little things that befuddle you. <laughs> you live in a terrace house in Blackburn, which is two up, two down, and that's where you're going to die. Actually, they weren't designed to get stirs uh, that get people up and down. They just were not designed in 1870 with that in mind. But that is the challenge we've got if you want to give people choice and personalised care in that way. Well, on that very personal note, we'll, we'll end. I won't remotely try and sum up, but I mean... One of the things that struck me is that this is a market that could actually be changing very fast and very quickly from a very old, from a, a long standing model to a very different one, quite rapidly. Uh, thank you. Could you just please say thank you very much to the panel and to A4E for doing it? Thank you for being here.